Before I went on my first smaller ship cruise, I was told to watch out as I would find myself unable to escape boring or annoying people as the ships are too small, while someone else told me the problem would be no atmosphere as too few people are on board to make trivia events and parties buzzing. This and other watch outs made me really wary until I clicked that all those warnings were misconceptions from people who had never even been smaller ship cruising. Though I did find, as you'll hear, how one belief is absolutely right and could be a deal breaker for many, including you. I'm Gary Bembridge, welcome aboard. First, what exactly do I mean by smaller ships? The industry includes ships of around 1,200 or fewer passengers in this category. So that ranges from ships like Oceania Marina, 1,200, Viking Ocean ships, 930, through to R-Class ships in the Azamara and Oceania fleet with around 700 guests, the ultra luxury lines like Seaborn and Silver Sea with 600, down to the small Windstar and Star Clippers with fewer than 150 on some. I've been on many smaller ship lines now, including Azamara, Windstar, Fred Olsen, Silver Sea, Seaborn, Crystal, Ponant, Hapag Lloyd, Oceania, Paul Gauguin, Voyages to Antiquity, and Saga. So let's start with what I found are the upsides from all of these trips. Smaller ships have a higher crew to passenger ratio, partly because they just need a certain amount of crew anyway to operate a ship. So for example, on my recent Azamara Quest and Seabourne Encore trips, there was double the amount of crew per passenger than I had on my recent Majestic Princess and Holland America New Staten Dam trips. I found service more personal, where crew in all departments got to know my name really quickly, they knew my preferences, they started to preempt me by delivering things like caffeine-free Diet Coke already at, when I sat down for dinner, the coffee bar knew that I liked skim milk, even the shore excursions team remembered what trips I'd been on and were recommending similar ones to me. On smaller ships, I always feel I'm being looked after in a much more personal way. The second obvious advantage it's easier to find my way around a smaller ship, partly as there's fewer decks. So while ships like Majestic Princess I mentioned had 19 decks, the Azamara Quest I was on the month before only had nine decks. I can get the feel of the layout really quickly, I can find out where everything is and not miss any hidden venues within a short time of boarding, ready to focus on my trip and of course the destinations. On larger ships, it takes ages and I've often missed or forgotten about venues, like I was almost through an entire cruise last year on Celebrity Silhouette before I even realized and found the huge Sky Lounge overlooking the bow. It takes much less time to get around and so popping say from dining to the show in the evening takes a couple of minutes rather than ages. One thing I like is the more adult only experience as there are no or only a few kids, even though only a few of the lines are officially adults only like Viking, and Saga. Now partly because of their size, but as they tend to be more destination and enrichment focused, they don't have kids clubs, kids programs, or family cabins usually. With smaller ship cruising, I love that with fewer guests, the check-in and disembarkation is an absolute breeze. For example, when I was on that Azamara Quest trip, it literally took minutes boarding in Barcelona. The same on Viking Sky the month before in Venice and all the other ones I've been on. The thing I also love is smaller excursion group sizes. The downside of that though, as I've seen, is you have to have a minimum numbers to operate excursions and there are definitely more frequent cancellations of tours than on bigger ships. On that Azamara Quest trip, they canceled many excursions and quite a few guests were upset because one of the reasons they'd chosen that Western Mediterranean itinerary was to go and visit some of the places on very specific excursions. Of course, on board, there are no to at best small lines, even for guest services, booking shore excursions and at the bar. The fifth upside and the reason that I now love going on smaller ship cruises is a more intensive way they give you to see a region. Bigger ships can only go to certain ports that can handle them and the passengers. It limits and makes those itineraries basically the same, especially in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. Many of those ports, particularly in the Mediterranean, tend to be working freight ports too. On a small ship, they can ease into smaller and out of the way places, especially as fewer guests makes mooring offshore and tendering guests into the port 
completely manageable. For example, when I was on Sibon Onko in the Greek islands, we did exactly that at stunning tiny little islands, many I hadn't even heard of before, with us the only ship visiting. While friends of mine on Celebrity Apex at the same time were calling only on big, well-trodden and tourist-packed ports. Also when calling into the bigger popular ports on other smaller ship trips, I found we often docked much closer to the action. For example, recently when I was in Marseille, we were docked right in the center of the town while the bigger ships were right way out in the freight port. When we were able to call on St. Petersburg on the Silver Sea, we were docked right next to the Hermitage Museum. All the big ships were miles and miles out. The same too in Ho Chi Minh City. Silver Sea was right in the center of the city while Queen Mary II and at the same time was docked an hour and a half away. I've also found less nickel and diming on board. That's partly because they often don't even have some of the departments like a photographic department. They don't have as many shops. They don't run art auctions. Also, as I will talk about a little bit more later, smaller ships fairs often have more inclusions. So unlike on bigger ships, I don't feel that I'm constantly being squeezed for more money. One of the biggest upside is smaller ship lines focus on food, possibly because they have fewer diversions on board to keep people busy. Food is even more important and there were and are more venues than I expected. Oceanic cruisers claim to have the finest cuisine at sea and reportedly spend more money per passenger on food than any other. But every smaller ship I've been on, I found dining is an important part of the experience with a main dining room, a buffet and speciality options. For example, on the Azamara ships and the smallest Oceania ships like Insignia and Serena, they have two speciality restaurants. In addition to that, they have the main dining room, the buffet, they have a grill style dining on the pool deck with burgers and other informal dining. On most small ships, specialty dining is included. I think the only exception to that is probably Azamara. So those are the upsides. What about the downsides and that big possible deal breaker? Many cruisers tell me they're nervous about small ship cruising due to more motion and so greater risk of seasickness. I do find bigger ships do tend to be more stable than smaller ships and smaller ships do move around much more, particularly if you're in the front or the rear of the ship, you do feel it much more than on bigger ships. Even when I was on Port Gauguin in French Polynesia, which doesn't have particularly rough seas, I could feel much more movement than I'd expected. Sailing to Iceland on both Voyages to Antiquity and Saga Sapphire was really noticeably bouncy where the seas are much rougher. So people that suffer from motion sickness can find smaller ships less comfortable. As I said at the start, I was warned about bumping into the same people, or as they put it, being stuck with boring people. I found that staying anonymous is definitely more of a challenge on a smaller ship, although I can, of course, be as sociable or as antisocial as I like anyway. But I discovered a flip side for people like me who are not that great at talking to strangers. It becomes much easier to meet incredible people because you do see them around more frequently. I have met and built some of the strongest cruising friendships on smaller ships. Jim and Cammie, who I met on Oceania, John and Simon on Seabourn, Ben and Sarah off Queen Mary 2, people that I have kept in contact with and met up with. I've met so many interesting people on smaller ships because I think travelers attracted to them they're looking for quirky and interesting destinations, and they tend, I've found, to have even more interesting backgrounds and stories than I've found often with people I've met on bigger ships. Of course, there is less choice, fewer venues, and a much slimmer daily program. Compare the daily program from two of the recent cruises I spoke about, one from Azamara Quest, small ship, and one from Majestic Princess. Huge difference in the amount going on. It suits me as when I'm on vacation, I want to unwind and don't need lots of entertainment laid on. I personally am happy with the choice of dining, which is pretty good, having a theater lounge with nightly singers, a bar or two with some live music, a fitness room, spa, a coffee shop and a lounge, overlooking the bow to hang out, and of course a pool and hot tubs. But you may need more, like my partner Mark, he wants big glitzy production shows. He wants a large and busy casino and a packed fitness class program. He's much less keen on small ships unless we're going for one of those port intensive tour of region like that one we did in the Greek islands. 
Leading on from that, a downside of smaller ship cruising is they cater incredibly well for couples, but if you're a solo traveler, much, much less so. Now I cruise often without Mark and very few smaller ship lines have solo fares or solo cabins. Although I'm seeing one or two starting to introduce them like Oceania, I often must pay the same price as if I was traveling with him. It definitely is a big ask as a solo traveler. On the issue of price, probably the biggest downside is price, even when traveling as a couple. Although I have some cheap options I'll mention shortly, smaller ships tend to be in luxury lines like Oceania, Azamara, Windstar, or ultra luxury ones like Region 7 Seas, Seabourn, and Silver Sea. Because during the pandemic, lines like Holland America and Princess sold off their smaller ships, offering a more value option. And then those that are still selling smaller ships also have more inclusions, and that pushes the price up too. If I go on a resort ship with over, say, 3,500 passengers, like Royal Caribbean, MSC, Carnival, Norwegian, I can easily get a balcony cabin from $100 to $200 per person per night. But a balcony on smaller ships range from $400 per person per night on lines like Asmar and Oceania, up to $800 on Seabourn. So it's four to eight times more expensive. Now there are some smaller value lines like Fred Olsen out the UK, Uncruise G Adventures, across Europe and some of the American cruise lines doing things at like the Great Lakes. But price is a challenge. Price is a big deal breaker for many when it comes to smaller ships. If it is for you, watch this video where, where I compare each of the four big cruise categories and recommend the best line in each of those right now, starting with the one that is the best value. See you over there.